first one is going to be Chris Rakakis. Um, if you haven't seen his stuff, it's it's really sort of some interesting work, maybe at the interface between numerical analysis and scientific computing methods on the one hand, and um, really sort of you know touching sort of nice applications in in um, you know biomedicine and related areas uh, on the other hand. So I had first seen his work there. I hadn't seen this particular work I'll be talking about here, but he'll be talking um, about some complementary work here on accelerating simulations of uh, stiff systems using continuous time uh, echo state networks. So it's all yours, Chris. Yep, thank you very much. So yeah, I'm Chris Rakakis, uh, MIT math instructor and director of scientific research at Pumas AI. And what I'm going to be talking about today is not only the, this, uh, this kind of issue about how you can handle stiff systems with uh, surrogates, but there's actually gonna be a whole trajectory that we go through here. So first, what I'm going to describe is, you know, why surrogatized um, dynamical systems are interesting and what kinds of problems they could potentially solve. Um, and then I'm gonna describe the continuous time echo state network, which is going to be mostly about what is the type of methodology that we need in order to make it so that way engineers can automatically use surrogates without having to worry about a lot of the details. You know, well, what is a robust surrogate? What does that mean? And how do we show that a surrogate can be robust? And after that, what I really want to do is I want to start bridging, you know, um, not, not just this methodology, but this field directly to the engineer. So I want to show how we're taking this and bringing this to engineering um, software and actually making this, this new platform called Julia Sim, which is allowing for surrogates to be automatically introduced into the engineer's workflow. So you know, the everyday mechanical engineer at, you know, at company X is then going to be building uh, you know, every air conditioning, every single uh, car with these kinds of surrogates. So I wanna really take a, a trajectory to show you how, we, how we're getting there and how far we are. Um, and what, what I really wanna start by emphasizing is that all aspects of the world around you are undergoing an engineering revolution. And that revolution is not necessarily just built on, you know, it, it's not just built on, you know, biological changes or, or changes in chemistry. It's built on changes in sim modeling and simulation, right? Solving differential equations at a higher scale with higher fidelity and more, and more acceleration um, is actually changing the, the way, the, the actual landscape of, of everything that's going on in this world. So for example, the faster drug development, um, this is something that actually we were a part of. So, so um, as Pumas AI, we developed the software for accelerating clinical trials, which was you know, adopted by groups like uh, Moderna, where it's been very public about, they've been very pub public about how it has accelerated their, their clinical trial workflows. And then this year, you know, 2020, um, we have seen, or well, last year, we, we saw the effects of what it means for, for you know, differential equation fitting to be faster in terms of the fastest vaccines that have been, ever been created, right? Um, we've also seen this in, in the sense of more efficient batteries, right? We're, we're really at the cusp where better battery design will lead us to battery powered airplanes, make it so that way electrical vehicles will overtake, you know, st uh, the standard uh, gas uh, vehicle that is out there right now. Another area that a lot of people might not know as much about is actually energy efficient buildings, which is that, um, you know, while, while a lot of what we talk about in terms of energy use is about uh, automobiles, um, actually energies take up a lot more energy, right? So um, automobiles are around 15% of energy use, uh, buildings are about 40%. And so there's a lot of research going on right now about how can we make buildings more efficient, which really comes down to control schemes um, and yeah, HVAC systems, heat flow equations, and it's all then dynamical systems. It's all partial differential equations and differential algebraic equations that are driving the new changes in how that we're, we're designing buildings. And last but not least, there's also all, all climate modeling and also improved agriculture. So we're working with uh, you know, groups for building this, what's known as an AgSciML program, um, which is being used to be able to discover where locusts are moving and be able to predict uh, uh, drought fail or crop failures. And this is all being done with you know, Fourier, uh, you know, these Fourier methods along with partial differential equations. You know, all, all these things really put together for automated model learning along with surrogatization. Right, so, so it's, you know, while it can be very abstract, you know, how mathematics is really touching the world, in, in, a, in a real sense, everything around you is being engineered by techniques that are using dynamical systems on the hood. And what it looks like when they're being built is like this, right? So um, many of you probably heard or maybe even used, you know, Simulink or Modelica. Um, these are some of the most standard tools for doing design, right? So, so these are, are, are looking at just simple circuit designs where 
you know, you, you, what, where, the way that these kinds of programs work is you have these little boxes, you know, these, these little integrators, or, you know, you have like a resistor, or you have an ideal gear, you have a lamp, right? Th these are models, these, these are pre-built models that are inside of the program that the, that the engineer is using and stitching them together. They're saying the voltage of this, uh, of this pin is equal to the voltage over here. And then they're using these, these pre-built models to build even larger models, just hierarchically building up these models. Um, there's generally two paradigms with, it, which, with which this is done. Um, causal modeling, which is all about building ODEs by saying, you know, X causes Y causes Z, where X, Y, and Z are themselves big differential equation models. And in the end, you get a very large differential equation model showing a you know, airplane and, and, you know, and um, you know, you have airplanes and car engines, which are all described in this manner, built in this manner, and then they are optimized using these kinds of tools. Uh, a causal modeling is kind of the tools that have really taken off in recent years because you no longer have to say that A causes B, you just have to say, you know, the, the, the voltage that comes out of A is equal to the voltage on this pin of B. And so you can have lack, lack causality, you get differential algebraic e equation systems. And so now many of the large companies throughout the world, like Bosch, are using, um, are, are really building all of their, their, their components using these kinds of, of, of domain modeling tools. Right. So the, my real goal here is to take these ideas of surrogatization and really find out how to make scientific machine learning accelerate the engineer's turf. Right. So this is how people are building things in reality. How do we get a form of surrogates, a form of scientific machine learning that affects that right there, that affects exactly how people are really using and building systems? Um, so we, we've already kind of gone in that direction quite a bit. Right. So the dually assignment organization. There, there was a really nice talk about our, our software. Um, I think that I'll let uh, Johnny uh, talk to, uh, dis uh, describe it himself. You can find the YouTube video. Um, he's from the NASA Watch Services where he talks about this new, um, this, this new program that's being used, I, I believe at JPL, which is Recursat, where, the, where we, it was able to get a 15,000 X acceler acceleration over Simulink using our new modeling toolkit.jl a causal tools. Right. So, so um, also uh, in the last year, we, we were actually awarded uh, something in 2020 for accelerating Pfizer's uh, quantitative system pharmacology workflows by 175x with accelerated uh, dynamical system solvers. So um, there are a lot of conventional uh, accelerations that can still be had in the in the workflows of these engineers. You know, not just you know mechanical engineers, but also bioengineering. So so. You know, this is really affecting the way that products are being created today, but how can we start to incorporate machine learning into the way that we're advancing this engineering future, right? And there's really two ways that people are, are looking at this problem, right? And they're really discussed a lot in this conference. Um, one is surrogates and automated model order reduction, right? So you can build a very high fidelity model, but if you don't need all of that fidelity, you might as well create a surrogate model to that, that, you know, gets the, enough resolution that you need that is able to do simulations with the resolution that you need just at a much faster pace. If you can do it at a faster pace, then you can try a whole bunch of different parameters you can try a whole bunch of different building designs and come up with the most energy efficient building to a, you know, to a degree of accuracy, which then matches as good as possible, right? Because you know, even your, your model is already not correct. So why are you trying to get the eighth decimal place correct in the first place, right? That's kind of like the high level overview where this low resolution object, you know, they could be, come from classical model order reduction techniques. But one of the main things people are looking at here, right, is how, how can this be done with machine learning techniques? The other branch uh, that, that we will not be focusing on today is automated model discovery, where if you have a physical model, a lot of times you might have data to augment that physical model. Um, and then you can use that data to tell you about things you did not know about the physics to help you get a better model. But today we're really just gonna be focusing on the acceleration aspect. So what is the problem that we really see when trying to do surrogates in this context, right? In the context of these control designs and in these you know, HVAC systems and in these pharmacometric models, it really comes down to stiffness. And, and a way to understand stiffness is that you have a fast system and a low system, uh, a slow system. And it, you know, I really think that it comes down to a picture. Like one picture really demystifies the whole subject of stiff stiffness, which is that if you have one very fast process, right? You have something jiggling really fast. And you have one slow process, which is moving, you know, it, it's just moving in, until going to a steady state, right? If you're, at, if you're to ask itself what the derivative is, is at this point, it is affected by the fast process because the fast process is moving up and moving down. And so if you want to know what happens when you go from T 
to d plus t plus delta t, right? You like the fast process is going up very rapidly and it's going down very rapidly. In some sense, the it, it's kind of like canceling itself out, right? It should be averaged out. But if you're just looking at instantaneous behavior like the derivative, then it's telling you that hey, this is the slope right here is very close to infinite. And so if you take a step using this derivative information, it will send you into a very wild place, right? So um, one one way that this has been described is that Ernst Herr famously said in his you know in the classic work on numerical differential equations that one way to, the best way to describe uh, stiff equations is that they're they're problems for which explicit methods don't work. And this is you could see why, right? So um, you know if you try to use derivative information and you extrapolate forward, well the derivative should have been somehow averaged over areas instead of just you know blindly taking it forward. And this is why all explicit methods, you know, OD45, um, you know, LSODE with Adams methods, right? All these things will fail unless you do something different. And so, you know, this has been a major numerical uh, problem, right? So, you know, you can think about the, the study of numerical ODEs as having solved how to do non-stiff ODEs very well sometime in the 80s and, and somewhere in the 80s, you know, people have not changed the techniques. But stiff ODEs, they're still changing the day because this is really the hard problem. And every engineering problem has this aspect, right? Because every engineering problem has something where you say, well, I turned on a heater here, you know, the, the, the electrical circuits turn on, everything happens instantly, but then the heat slowly goes through my room, right? And, and so once you have that, that time scale difference, you end up having a real problem, but you also have real numerical problems. And so the real challenge that we were looking at was how can you train a, a surrogate to accelerate one of these arbitrarily highly stiff systems, right? So here's a picture of one that comes from a very classic Orego problem, right? So this is one of the problems where if you if you open up a, a numerical analysis book on numerical methods for stiff differential equations, this is one of the methods that they'll say, you know, um, you know, most of the integrators that people write by hand will fail on this. And so good software is something that solves this. So, you know, we just kind of think, you know, that, that those kinds of, of classic test problems might be good test problems to start with when saying, okay, what kinds of surrogate techniques can work on, you know, hard problems? Well, let's just take some of these small hard problems and see what fails. And you can immediately see that a lot of the techniques from machine learning just will not work, right? So for example, let's take a look at a recurrent neural network. A recurrent neural network, in one way to think about it, is that it is the Euler discretization to a neural ODE. And so, you know, as we just said in the last slide, um, stiff equations are where explicit methods don't work. It, Euler's method is a explicit method. And so, you know, for, for sure, you're probably going to have these kinds of blowups. And, and we'll see in, in, a, in a, just in a few slides from now that this really, that these types of, you know, recurrent neural networks and LST PMs, they very much fail on these types of equations. Um, the second reason why, you know, these types of methods from machine learning will not work well is that they're uniform, right? Um, but the, the information about these types of stiff problems are not uniform in time, right? You care much more about finding out the dynamics here where, you know, you want to use very small time steps here and you want to use big time steps here because you know, this is almost just a straight line. So, what, you know, you don't need very many time points to get a straight line, but you need a lot of time points to figure out exactly where the spike is going to hit, right? So, so these kinds of recurrent neural networks and LSTMs are really just not an architecture that will work at all on these types of real engineering problems because a they're based off of ideas from explicit uh, predictions which you know if you have in a, if you're trying to predict based off of what's happening right now you will not predict correctly on these types of problems but b they also do not take into account the continuous nature of the problem and they're not adjusting continuously in time right so so what, so this kind of gives us a, a nice jumping point where we can say well you know, if these things don't work because of these properties, how do we start to solve and, and find something that, that is able to handle these properties? So the first thing that we started looking at was physics and some neural networks, right? Because um, they, they're very popular, um, but it, what we found was that, you know, they, they have some issues of stiffness as well. Um, actually, we, we did not do this work, right? So Paris uh, Peritikars uh, did a very nice study on what happens when you're solving a pin on a very stiff differential equation. Um, and what happens is the stiffness of the differential equation turns into a stiffness of the training problem, right? Because when you say gradient descent, what you're actually doing is you're finding the parameters of the, of the neural network by solving an ODE based on the gradient going to zero. And if you, put, if you take that ODE and you apply Euler's method to the gradient flow, that is gradient descent. 
And so you're once again in that situation where you are applying an explicit method to a stiff problem where every single classic numerical methods book will tell you explicit methods don't work, right? Um, so so th this, this, uh, this, what this paper did was it showed that there are some ways to kind of try to poke things to get it to work. But, you know, they, so they showed that when you had a, a stiffness of 10 to the fifth in, you know, in the ill conditioning of the Jacobian, right, which is like, you know, you have five orders of magnitude time scale difference between one process and the fast process and the slow process. They showed that if you make your time steps be small enough and adaptive, on the on the training process, then it, it could work for, for the scale, right? Where as you increase the stiffness, you make need to make your time steps smaller and smaller. Now, if, if you know your numerical analysis, right? Well, this, this time scale, this time step limitation on, on the gradient flow, where that's coming from, is that it's an explicit process. And explicit processes have a maximum stability region. And so you need to decrease that that time step in cost, right? So with it, so this is telling us that you know it does handle something very well, right? Because the pin, the pin is a continuous architecture. So it's really, you know, it's showing us that continuous architectures can do something, but it's not doing everything because it is still, do, it's still doing the training process explicitly. And so what we did instead was we said, we reimagined what these neural ODEs are to turn it into something that can have a implicit training process. There's two ways to actually understand this, this idea. One is as a form of reservoir computing, where a reservoir computing, base, what you basically do is you say, I have some kind of dynamical system. And what I want to do is I want to just let this dynamical system run. And I want to find a projection from this random dynamical system to my original one, right? And so what we can do is we can fix a random non-stiff ODE, and then we can project that to our stiff ODE to be able to, to reconstruct our system. Um, another way of looking at that though, is that we take a, a neural ODE, and then, but we make it so that way the last layer is, you know, we, we fix all of the layers in the, in the neural ODE, except the last layer. So all we have to do is we have to just train the, the values of that last layer to be correct. And it turns out then if you can, if you can, if you can invert the output uh, activation function, then you can transform this entire training problem into an SVD. And if you know, you know, your numerical analysis, SVDs have low growth factors, they work really well on highly open condition matrices, and so you get a fully implicit training problem that is able to do well on highly non uh, on highly stiff equations, um, and that's really the, the the gist of the method. But I think what matters more is the intuition behind how you get there. Right? And so when we take a look at this uh, Robertson equation. The re the reason why we do this is because this is again one of these classic problems that people would use to break integrators and break numerical methods. So we said, well, let's see what what surrogates break on this, and let's see what surrogates don't break on this. It looks like there's nothing going on because you just have a species one go up, species two go down. But if you actually, you know, if you zoom in, right, if you do like the FBI thing of enhance, right? Um, what we, here we zoom in on just like this, we, we plot everything in log log scale. And what we see is that the second species has a little bump and that bump is an auto, uh, auto catalyst reaction. And so um, it, you actually need this bump to happen. Otherwise you never have species one change to species two. And the stiffness of this, you know, the time scale separation is around 10 to the ninth because you have, uh, you have some reaction rates at 10 to the seventh, some all the way down to 0 0.04, right? And, and so this is why, you, so you have this like 10 to the seventh condition chain, something that you can never do with, you know, thin gradient descent. And we, we, we tried for a long time to get that to work, but maybe this, this new implicit way of training can work. And what we show in, in the paper is that it precisely um, you know, LSTMs fail, echo state networks without continuous behavior fails, pins fail. And um, the only thing that can really capture the true dynamics on this problem are these continued time echo state networks. And not only that, because they are really simulating a non-stiff system and projecting back to a stiff system, um, they have the, 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 the computational cost of a non-stiff system, which is then growing at, you know, which is a growing acceleration as you get to harder and harder problems. And so and what we show uh, you know, shortly after this paper is that if you take one of these, uh, these Modelica tools like Daimola, we can accelerate against uh, their, their you know, we, we can get about a six act acceleration against them just by using the Julius IML tools. You know, they're just a bit more optimized. But when we apply this kind of surrogate to these kinds of systems, which have these really large jumps, right? These, these really highly stiff behaviors that were these other techniques failed, um, we're able to get about a 60x to 570x acceleration on a vapor compression cycle. 
Now, why this is important though, is because we can take this vapor compression cycle, right? This is in the context of an acausal modeling tool now. So we can take this, this vapor compression cycle, replace it with the neural network, replace this neural network term inside of the heating element, place this, this neuralized heating element inside of you know, these building models and actually accelerate the, 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 the way that we're designing real buildings. And this is where we've kind of gone to now, where we have a whole software that lets you replace elements with surrogates and then do the full-scale design process with surrogatized models. Now, if, if you are doing this in this component-wise way, then you, know, you don't necessarily need to be training them yourself. If someone has already pre-trained you know, a faster version of an air conditioning, you might as well use it. And so this is where we're launching Julia Sim, where we have a whole bunch of these different models, a whole library model, a uh, whole bunch of different libraries of you know QSP models uh, for things like carts and things like uh, these heating cycles, which are all pre-trained continuous time echo state networks um, to be able to give you that you know 10x, 100x acceleration and just let you plop it into full-scale models. And this is really where we're at now. Um, we're we're just about to start launching this over the summer where you know, it really, it's going to be a competitor to something like you know, Simulink or Modelica, where it's going to use the SciML techniques that everyone in this conference is you know, so excited about, is really building these directly into the modeling process to bring it directly to the engineers. And so in conclusion, um, you know, there's so many different aspects of design that are changing because of scientific machine learning techniques. And um, we hope to kind of, you know, here is one method that we've been adding to this, but we're really learning from everyone else in the community here and incorporating this into a next generation tool. So thank you very much. All right, that was great. Thanks a lot.